When I was a teenager, I lived in a small town located about 30 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't get my driver's license in my first car until I was almost 20. So between the ages of 16 and 19, I hitchhiked frequently. This was in the early 70s when people still hitchhiked and many drivers were still willing to pick people up, in spite of the dangers and risks both posed to the driver and the rider. For the most part, I never had any trouble with the people who offered me rides, but occasionally, I would get picked up by someone who would totally creep me out. This is a story about one creepy ride I accepted and how 25 years later, I would discover to my great shock that I may have been much luckier at the time than I had ever imagined. This incident occurred sometime in the summer of 1974 when I was 17. At the time, I was a 6 foot tall, 175 pound, blonde hair, blue eyed guy who did not have any trouble connecting with girls for dates. In fact, my story begins with me standing on the side of the highway with my thumb out as I was trying to get back home after spending the weekend with my girlfriend who lived in downtown Atlanta. I was traveling south away from the city and out into the country where I lived with my parents. I recall that I had only had my thumb out for about 15 minutes when a man in a big white Lincoln town car, a very large and expensive car at the time, pulled over. As I walked up to the car, I scanned the inside and looked at the driver, trying to size the situation up as I always did, just to be safe. What I saw was a tidy car with a man in the driver's seat who looked to be in his late 30s or mid 40s, dressed in an expensive suit and tie. He had short black hair, wore black rimmed eyeglasses, and appeared to be rather on the thin side with a gone face and dark eyes. I never learned his name, but for the sake of this story, we'll call him Town Car Man. When I got up to the passenger side of the car, I leaned down toward the open window and told him where I was heading to and asked him if he was going that far, and to which he replied that he was, in a soft voice, and he waved me into the car. I was not at all wary of him, and by all appearances, he was just an ordinary middle class businessman, and I opened the door and got into the front seat next to him without any hesitation. Generally, when I accepted rides from strangers while hitchhiking, I tried to engage them in a chat, sort of as a way to pay them for the ride by providing good conversation, and also to put them at ease about picking me up by showing that I was a harmless guy and not a creep, even though I felt that I did not at all look dangerous, only if you could call having long hair and dressing in the hippie fashion of the time dangerous. However, when I began trying to chat with a town car man in my normal fashion, just a typical small talk, I instantly started getting bad vibes from him, as I could tell that he was mostly ignoring what I was saying and instead, kept trying to steer the conversation toward asking me personal questions about myself, such as how old I was, where I went to school, if I had a girlfriend, etc., I tried to answer his questions politely as possible without really giving away much real information. But Town Car Man kept getting more and more personal, asking questions that hinted at whether or not I was sexually active with my girlfriend, telling me that when he was my age, he went around all juiced up all the time and had always been on the lookout for different adventures. As the ride progressed and we were going further and further out into the country, I began to get very uneasy as I started to sense that something was not quite right with him. We had left the populated city behind, and were now traveling down an old two-lane highway through countryside that was sparsely populated. There seemed to be hardly any other cars on the road. The more that town car man continued to ask me questions about myself, wanted to know very personal things about me, like if I ever did it with my girlfriend all while glancing over at me from time to time with a sort of creepy, knowing look in his eye, as if he was privately enjoying some dirty secret that only he knew about. The more uncomfortable I became, 
I don't know how to better describe it than that it really began to make me feel uneasy. As his manner seemed very cagey and I totally sensed that, there was some underlying motive to his questioning. It really put me on guard. I began to think about what I should do next, as in, should I ask him to pull over and let me out? Even though I was only about halfway to my destination, and out in the middle of nowhere. For the first time, I began to realize just how vulnerable I felt. But what really made me start to feel uneasy was when he started asking me if I wanted a drink of liquor, indicating that he had several bottles with him in the trunk, and that if I wanted some, he could pull over to the side of the road and mix me up a stiff drink. Because I was growing more and more uncomfortable, I declined his offer, saying that I did not drink, which was a lie as even at that age, I normally drank with friends a lot. But he would not take no for an answer and he kept insisting that I should really just have one drink, because he was such a great drink mixer, and it would only take him a minute for him to mix that very special one for me. After I had declined this offer for something like the fourth time, he abruptly changed tactics again and began telling me a story about when he was about my age and a young guy in the army and how he used to like to hitchhike a lot too and that he would sometimes get picked up by men who wanted to pay him money to have sex with him and he had anything like that ever happened to me. By this time, I had had quite enough of all this and I looked him straight in the eye and said, no, that has never happened to me. And no, nobody has ever made an offer to me like that. Well, the knowing look vanished instantly from his face. And I could tell that he was totally irked by how I had just reacted to his story. That exchange between us totally changed the dynamic inside of the car and he became very quiet. After a few minutes of this uneasy silence, he spoke up and told me that he was turning at the next intersection and that I would need to get out there, even though he had told me when he had first picked me up that he was going my entire way. At this point, I was actually very relieved and not only wanted to get out of the car. When the car came to a stop, I had just barely gotten out of the car and pushed the door closed when he had stepped on the gas and zoomed off, literally jerking the handle of the car out of my hand. I remember that I stood there watching him drive away, until he disappeared down the road, and that my heart was beating very fast. I was both scared and angry at what had just happened. After I had calmed down, I resumed hitchhiking until I got under the ride that took me home without a further incident. Now fast forward 25 years, it's 1999, and I had all but forgotten about my creepy ride with Tom Carman. I'm on the internet reading through a true crime website when I stumbled upon a story about an ultra creepy guy named Robert Bennett, a man who had been arrested after a series of vicious attacks on men whom he had picked up in his car, drugged, handcuffed, and then set their you-know-what's on fire with a flammable liquid. The attacks took place over a 20-year period, starting around 1968 in the Atlanta area and ending with his arrest in 1991. Prior to Bennett's arrest, this attacker became known as the Handcuff Man, and talk within the local community was that he was targeting men who he thought were up to no good. When I saw the photo of Bennett that accompanied the article, my jaw literally dropped, and the memories of my ride that day in 1974 came flooding back. I was certain I was looking at a picture of a Tarnkar Man, and I was absolutely floored. I do not have any way to prove that the creepy guy who picked me up was in fact this Robert Bennett, but the physical resemblance between what I remember about Tarnkar Man and the photo of Bennett is absolutely uncanny, and the persistent offer by Tarnkar Man to mix me a special drink, and his constant questions asking about my sexual activity. I really got lucky here. I took in a hitchhiker that turned out to be crazy. As in legit crazy. I won't ever do that anymore and hopefully my experience will discourage you to do too. 
I live in a foreign country, and I don't know about your country's sanitary measures against the epidemic, but at the time, we were no longer confined. It happened in September of this year. I was driving from my parents' house to a friend's apartment near our college campus. It was an hour and a half drive to there. We had plans to spend the week together after not seeing each other for months. Even though the incident is not related to my friends in any way, it just hit me how dangerous it actually was when I started telling them what had happened. I remember one of them saying, this must have been the worst 45 minute drive of my life. I laughed at it back then, but it hits me now how true it was. I left quite late that day around 9pm, because I remember the sun had already set and I was going to arrive late which I didn't like. But I was used to the road as I had often taken it. For some context, it was an hour and a half drive and I would usually stop midway in a McDonald's parking lot to smoke a cigarette before carrying on. This is important for later in the story. I saw the hitchhiker not long after I left my parents' house. I had driven for about 10 or 15 minutes when I saw him at the exit of a roundabout. It was a tall, slender guy with one of those tiny shoulder bag guys that they wear across the chest. I thought it was a guy in his 20s that had just been dropped by his friends on his way back from a party or something. Which was stupid because it was still way too early for a party to end. But that's the first thought that I had and I immediately felt sympathy and I stopped. I opened the passenger window and asked where he was going. I realized right away that he was way older than I thought, at least in his 30s. He had a really pale face and the way he looked at me honestly freaked me out. The guy was going in my direction, to the town where I would be stopping midway to take a break. I don't know what I was thinking to be honest, but I just responded automatically that it was on my way and that he opened the door. And I had the worst next 45 minutes of my life. I don't mean to be dramatic, but it really went to hell. I knew right away that I had made a mistake as I drove off, because as soon as I had started driving, he started holding onto his stomach tightly, crouching himself in the passenger seat and going back and forth saying that he wasn't feeling good. I offered to open the windows for some fresh air. He said that he just had to take his medication, which he never did. Saying that I felt uncomfortable is an understatement. I remember thinking that I had screwed up and whatever happened, I should not stop under any circumstances. The first thing I did was ask him if he would be okay if I dropped him off at that city's McDonald's. It had a lit parking lot, and there were always people there until midnight, so I could leave immediately onto a fast road. I think he agreed, but either way, it didn't matter because I wasn't planning on stopping elsewhere. I was already freaked out, thought that I had pretended to focus on the road and tried to appear as calm as I could, and he kept talking during this whole time. I don't remember in what order it happened exactly, but I remember he asked me if he could look at my nails. I had no nail polish, to which I responded I was driving. He apologized and said that I shouldn't worry because he had never done anything bad to anyone before. He told me that his girlfriend was mad at him. Why did you break up with him if he didn't come back? He asked where I was going, what I was planning on doing tonight, if I was planning to have a long hot bath, if I had a boyfriend, how he liked to do it. I said that all of that was private and that I didn't want to answer it. He nodded and said that he was young once too until he got arrested. This is not a typo. Young until arrested were his words. He insisted twice that we were followed by cars. Asked me if I smoked. I said no. He offered me a cigarette. I said it was nice, but he didn't have to. He left a cigarette on the board. He took out his phone at one point and wanted to show me a picture of him and a picture of his mom saying that she was beautiful. I took a quick glimpse and the freaking thing was broken. Like it had multiple straight black lines of broken pixels and it was reddish on the left and yellowish on the right, which made the picture really creepy. He got mad at that point because I was just taking a quick glimpse. 
and he started talking louder, saying that I didn't give a crap about what he was saying. I straight up said, I'm listening, but I can't watch. I'm driving. He calmed down immediately, said he was sorry, and that he wanted to show me another picture. He asked if it was my car, and I said that it was my parents'. Somehow, I didn't want him to think that I was rich or had any kind of money. I'm just a poor, old, in-debt student. Leave me alone. I lied saying that I had hit a deer last week, which is a lie. My mom had, but that memory came in handy. And I was trying to focus and pay attention because I didn't want to break my parents' car. I had hoped that he would shut up, but he didn't. And at some point, he was just straight up staring at me, and he muttered, Poor thing. He then straightened up and pointed to a road sign in panic saying, I meant the road sign. Poor road sign. Honestly, I think at that point I was thinking if he ever tried anything, I would crash this car and both of us into a tree, because if I couldn't make it out, neither would he. I'm ashamed to say this, but I didn't want him to get out of this so easily. He screamed his name was Archangel Michael. He asked my name and I gave him a fake one. Said something like, Michael, right? And he crouched himself again in panic going back and forth, saying that I shouldn't know his name. I said okay, to be honest, that was the only thing that I would say in the end. When we came to the city where he had to stop, he asked if I could take him to the train station. It was almost 10pm and I knew no trains were running. No lights and surely no other cars or human presence. I told him that we had said he would stop at McDonald's. He nodded. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said that I was nice. Put a coin on the board next to the cigarette. I stopped on the parking lot and I did not park. Just stopped there right in the middle of the way where I felt I was the most exposed. He just left saying, see you later. And I drove away very fast. I never saw or heard from him again. This is a story about a man named John that I met while working in retail. John is an older white man in his mid-fifties, well-dressed, well-spoken, shorter length, steel gray hair and a low ponytail tied back. At the time, I was working at a farm and a pet supply store. I was called over to help a customer look at electric fences and shock collars for dogs, which I am against, but I had to help the customer. I asked him what I could help him with, and he said that he was interested in an electric fence for his dogs, since he had a cabin in the woods and wanted to make sure that they didn't get away. He said, No, oh, yes, I'm looking to use this shock collar. Maybe I knew. Thoroughly creeped out. I tried to laugh it off and tell him, oh, no thank you. I finally got him someone who knew more than I did, and thought that that would be the end of it. Of course it wasn't. The next time he saw me, he said, I've been looking for you. I bought what I wanted, and didn't know what you said. I want to slap you the next time that I saw you. I told him that if he ever hits me, I would absolutely hit him back. So then, a few days later, he told me he would really, really like to take me out to lunch one day. And I politely declined. He would come into the store and look for me. I had seen him before he saw me. But one day, I saw him first. I hid until I thought he had left, but no. He found me back in my department. He said, Just so you know, I'm not dressed up for you today. I have a meeting with the bank, but if I didn't, I would be taking you out to lunch. You know, I can tell you dyed your hair. You look so beautiful, but that doesn't mean anything to you, does it? I might mean something if you liked me back. He was never banned from the store, even after one of my managers heard him say these things to me. But my co-workers would tell me when he was in the store and help me get away from him until he left. I haven't seen him since I quit, and I am so thankful. I took in a hitchhiker that turned out to be crazy. 
as in that legit crazy. I won't ever do that anymore and hopefully my experience will discourage you to do too. I would like to apologize in advance for my mistake since I am not a native speaker. I'll try my best to tell this properly. Now, I live in a foreign country and I don't know about your country's sanitary measures against the epidemic, but at the time, we were no longer confined. It happened in September of this year. I was driving from my parents' house to a friend's apartment near our college campus. It was an hour and a half drive to there. We had plans to spend the week together after not seeing each other for months. Even though the incident is not related to my friends in any way, it just hit me how dangerous it actually was when I started telling them what had happened. I remember one of them saying this must have been the worst 45 minute drive of my life. I laughed at it back then. But it hits me now how true it was. I left quite later that day around 9pm because I remember the sun had already set and I was going to arrive late, which I didn't like. But I was used to the road as I had often taken it. For some context, it was an hour and a half drive and I would usually stop midway in a McDonald's parking lot to smoke a cigarette before carrying on. This is important for later in the story. I saw the hitchhiker not long after I left my parents' house. I had driven for 10-15 to 15 minutes or so when I saw him at the exit of a roundabout. It was a tall, slender guy, with one of those tidy shoulder bags guys wear across their chest. I thought it was a guy in his 20s that had just been dropped off by his friends on his way back from a party or something, which was stupid because it was still too early for a party to end. That's the first thought that I had and I immediately felt sympathy and I stopped. I opened up the passenger window and asked where he was going. I realized right away that he was way older than I had thought, at least in his 30s. He had a really pale face and the way he looked at me, honestly it freaked me out. The guy was going in my direction to the town where I would stop midway to take a break. I don't know what I was thinking to be honest. I just responded automatically that it was on my way and that he could open the door and get in. And the next 45 minutes of my life were the worst. I don't mean to be dramatic but it really was hell. I knew right away that I had made a mistake as I drove off because... As soon as I had started driving, he grabbed his stomach tight, crouched himself in the passenger seat, doing a back and forth saying that he wasn't feeling good. I offered to open the windows for some fresh air. He said that he just had to take his meds, which he didn't. Saying that I felt uncomfortable is an understatement. I remember thinking that I had screwed up and that whatever happened I should not stop under any circumstances. The first thing I did was ask him if he would be okay if I dropped him off at that city's McDonald's. It had a lit parking lot, and there were always people there until midnight. Also, after I would drop him off, I could leave immediately onto a fast road. I think he agreed, but either way, it didn't matter because I wasn't planning on stopping elsewhere. I was already freaked out. Though I pretended to focus on the road and I tried to appear as calm as I could, and he kept talking during the whole time. I don't remember in what order it happened exactly. But I do remember him asking if he could look at my nails and I said no because I was driving. He apologized and said that I shouldn't worry because he had never taken advantage of anyone before. He told me that his girlfriend was mad at him, wanted to break up with him if he didn't come back. Asked where I was going, what I was planning to do tonight. If I was planning to have a long, steaming bath, if I had a boyfriend, how we like to do it? And I said that was private and that I didn't want to answer. He nodded, said that he used to be young too until he got arrested. This is not a typo. Young until arrested were his words. He insisted twice that we were followed by cars. I asked me if I smoked weed. I said no. 
He offered me a cigarette, and I said that was nice, but he didn't have to. He left the cigarette on the board. He took out his phone at one point and wanted to show a picture of himself and a picture of his mom. I took a quick glimpse and his phone was broken. Like it had multiple straight black lines of broken pixels and it was reddish on the left and yellowish on the right, which made the picture really creepy. He got mad at that point because I was just taking a quick glimpse and he started talking louder saying that I didn't care about what he was saying. I straight up said, I am listening, I can't watch because I'm driving. He calmed down immediately, said okay and that he was sorry, and he wanted to show me another picture. He asked if it was my car. I said it was my parents. Somehow, I didn't want him to think that I was rich or had any kind of money. I'm just a poor, old, in debt student. Leave me alone. I lied saying that I'd hit a deer last week, which is a lie. My mom had, but that memory came in handy. And I was trying to focus and pay attention because I didn't want to ruin my parents' car. I had hoped he would shut up, but he didn't. At some point, he was just straight up staring at me, and he muttered, Poor thing. He then straightened up and pointed to a road sign in panic, saying, I'm at the road sign. Poor road sign. Honestly, I think at that point I was thinking if you ever tried anything... I would crash this car and both of us into a tree, because if I couldn't make it out, neither of us would. I'm ashamed to say this, but I didn't want him to get out of this so easily. He screamed that his name was Archangel Michael. He asked my name, and I gave him a fake one. He crouched again, cradling his stomach, with panic going back and forth, saying that I shouldn't know his name. I just said okay, to be honest. That was the only thing I would say in the end. When we came into the city where he had to stop, he asked if I could take him to the train station. It was almost 10pm and I knew there were no trains, no lights and surely no other cars or human presence. I told him that we had said he would stop at McDonald's. He nodded, oh yes, yes. He said that I was nice. He put a coin on the board next to the cigarette. I stopped in the parking lot and I did not park. I just stopped right there in the middle of the way, where I felt like I was most visible. He just left saying, see you later, and I drove away very fast. I never saw or heard of him again. So I guess I found out why people don't pick up hitchhikers now. As I was driving from Texas to California, around an hour after I would started my drive, I saw this guy with his dog on Route 66 in the middle of nowhere, at least 3 miles from even the nearest gas station. It was cold and I wasn't in a rush so I decided to ask him if he wanted to ride. It turns out he was trying to go to a city in Arizona that was only 20 miles off my route, so I offered to let him join in my trip. He was chill, he seemed normal and looked like he cared for his dog. His original story was that he started walking in Mississippi after some BS reason. He lost his job and everything went down the drain. So he hitchhiked to Texas, where he got stuck for three months, and was trying to get to his mom so that she could help him out. I bought him some food after asking if he ate, which he said that he hadn't. Okay, them good deed endorphins are hitting just right and I feel like I'm doing a good thing. After around 200 miles, he tells me that he had just called his mom while I was refilling my gas tank, and apparently she had went to Los Angeles for vacation, so he would just ride with me until I got to California. Okay, kind of weird and sporadic, but I didn't pay it too much mind. We chatted and again, he seemed pretty normal, until we got to Arizona. He started bringing up politics and got a little bit crazy with them. Okay, red flag but I just asked him to drop it as I don't like to talk about it. He then asked me if I could just drop him off at his two girlfriends at his house which he got after his mom had passed and he had inherited in a town in Arizona. He said that he had called beforehand and they were expecting him after three months away. Also, he mentions almost like nothing during an earlier conversation that he has mild schizophrenia. I started putting it all together. Oh crap, I don't think he even has a coherent goal of what he's doing. 
So, when we get to Arizona finally, and we're on the last 10 miles to us now, one girlfriend which he claims he loves, I start to wonder, am I about to drop a mentally ill man off two states away, in the middle of nowhere, where it's about to get freezing temperatures tonight? Oh, and the plot twist. He apparently didn't even have a cell phone. As we got to his girlfriend's house, I told him, hey, do you want me to wait here just in case she isn't home? Thinking that I could at least talk him to letting me drop him off at a nearby homeless shelter or something. And exactly what I thought had happened, happened. I guess I just got the wrong info. And she doesn't live there. My other family members live there though. Yeah, let's just go to California to see my mom. As he sat down in the car, which I had been driving with him for over 9 hours, I told him that maybe he wasn't in the best mental state at the moment, and his mental illness could be playing tricks on him. He flipped his crap out of nowhere, and said that if I brought up his schizophrenia again, he would attack me. He wasn't threatening at all, so I simply said, Bro, I don't feel comfortable driving you to California, but I don't want to leave you and your dog in a place that is about to be freezing cold. Do you at least want me to drop you off at a homeless shelter? He then responded, Screw you man, I'll walk to Cali myself. We were currently in a mountain town of Arizona, where it's about to be freezing cold and he has no money, food or water. With at least 10 miles down a pretty uninhabited road, and I'm pretty sure that he didn't have family that lived in the house that he went to. And he just left with his dog and I sat there dumbfounded. And then I left as there was nothing more I could have done at this point. I don't know where you are dude but I hope you're safe. And you need to get some help for you and your dog's sake. I'm not the best storyteller so bear with me. Also, posting this from my phone so apologies for the formatting. This took place last weekend and the more I think about it, the more creeped out I feel. My dad had told me to get gas from down the road for his old beat up car, for an exact amount and to get the receipt in that he needed it quick because he was on a timer. He had rented a truck and needed to unload it quickly and return it. I didn't have time to change out of my weekend uniform, of the rattiest t-shirt and joggers combo. Now, the gas station in question was just a few blocks down the road, but fell into the sketchy part of the neighborhood but it was also the closest and cheapest. When I pull into the station, it's fairly busy with most pumps occupied. Since I was driving an old car that had a hard time maneuvering, I pulled into the pumps furthest away from everyone, so I minimized the chances of hitting anyone. It took me a while to get the car into position. I had parked too far the first time. By the time I get out, another car had pulled into the pump behind me in the next row. I don't know much about cars, but this was a big black jeep, an expensive type from a cursory glance. As I walked around my car to the pump, the driver gets out and sorts of looks around when he sees me, and gives me a big smile and wave, which I return with a polite nod and smile, which was really more of a reflex than an actual greeting. I don't really pay too much attention as I start fiddling with the pump, but he's still in my field of vision, as he's just sort of staring at me, looking like he wants to approach. Around this time, I start to feel uneasy. It has also occurred to me that, that I was far away from the other patrons, and more or less blocked from view by the pumps. The feeling of unease sort of grew, but I don't know why, but I wanted to get out of there ASAP. But to pump gas, I had to turn my back to him, something I didn't want to do. I tried to open the gas tank, but since it's an old car, it seemed to be stuck, and I could see him slowly walk towards me. Luckily, another car had pulled into the pump next to me. Seeing the other car, he seemed to stop his approach and went back to his car, and I quickly started to fill mine up. But as luck would have it, the pump didn't give me a receipt. A quick glance told me the man was still there by his car, staring quite intently at me with a big smile that really creeped me out. I figured quickly I would go and ask inside for the receipt, which would also mean I would be around other people. I lock my car and I quickly walk over to the store, 
all the while feeling intensely on edge. And inside the store, it's pretty crowded and as I stand in line, I tell myself that I'm being paranoid and I've watched too many episodes of Criminal Minds. It takes about 10 minutes. I get my receipt and when I walk out, the car is still there but I don't see the guy. With my head down, I quickly walk to my car. As I come around, I see he's sort of slouching and leaning in between his car and the pump. As soon as he sees me, he straightens up and quickly starts walking over to me, smiling and waving. Hey, can you spare some money for food? I mumbled a quick, hey sorry, no cash, and I got in the car, locking it as soon as I closed the door, which turned out to be a good thing because just as the doors had locked, he tried to yank open the passenger door. My heart is literally in my throat as he tries a few more times to open the car door, all the while smiling that creepy smile. At that moment, another car had pulled in behind and honked. God bless this person. Startled, he stepped away from my car. I didn't wait. I peeled away as quickly as I could. I work in the bad part of the city where I'm approached frequently by meth heads and drunks. The difference is, I've never gotten that kind of gut feeling before. For all I know, he really was hungry and wanted some money for food. But he also got out of a really expensive and well cared for looking car. Which is also something I realized later on. I figure, at best, I overreacted. And at worst, I could have been shot or abducted. I live in Finland in a fairly small city and this happened to me a year ago when I was 14. So, it was a Friday evening and on every Friday, our mom let us go to the store and buy candy. So me and my 12 year old sister left her house to go to the store and it was already dark outside. We made our way to the closest store which was over a mile away. While walking at some point, there is a man behind us walking the same way. But I didn't think much about it at the time. You could just be going to the same store. So, I continued chatting with my sister while the man is behind us following at a safe distance. We get to the store with no complications, and the man had followed us into the store. We take our time selecting our candy and get to the register to pay. While I was packing the candy to my backpack, I saw this man buying only a single chocolate bar. It's pretty far away to go for just a chocolate bar, I thought. And at this point, my suspicions start to rise for this guy. I go out of the store with my sister and we start to make our way back. We walk for a while then I quickly glance back and the man was still there following us. I took a look at my sister who seemed totally unaware about the man's presence. We continue our walk and up ahead of us was an unlit dirt road that continued for a good part of the trip. So, I look at my back again and there is the man still about 60 feet away. At this point, I was almost certain that he was following us because on our way to the store he did not walk this part of the way behind us. The dirt road goes through a forest and it had a curve at the start of it. Once we get to the curve, I look back and notice that the man can't see us. And so I pull my sister to the woods and we duck down behind them. My sister's saying something and I just whisper, stay quiet, to her as I wait for the man to come. I could see the man's shadow coming down the road and he started looking for us from the road. He walked back and forth for a little bit. My heart was racing and I tried to be as quiet as possible. The man didn't find us but continued running forwards. We stayed in the forest for a while before getting the courage to come out. We walked the rest of the way home with no problems and we got back to our house. We ate our candy and we had a good evening, but that really did bother me for a while and especially my sister. Thinking about this it still gives me the chills and the thought of getting caught in that situation creeps me out and I try not to think about it. I wouldn't want to see this guy ever again. I was on a hitchhiking adventure from BC, Canada to Antigua, Guatemala, which started in September 2019. This post is taken from the notes in my journal, 
which I wrote as soon as I could after this insane experience. If you've ever hitchhiked before, you know how amazing it is and how many cool people you can meet. Out of thousands of rides across 40 countries, I've only had two bad and or dangerous encounters at thumbing it. This was my second one. I was taking a break from traveling to find weed trim work in California's Nevada City, a beautiful little town with a very interesting crowd. We got stuck a few towns over for not getting a ride all day. I ended up sleeping a night at the Love's gas station, which I had done plenty of times before. I've slept in worse places, at least Love's has a bathroom. In the morning, I was a little more desperate to accept rides because no one was stopping and it had already been a whole day. I just wanted to get out of there. A pickup truck is speeding past me and slams the brakes ahead, and then slowly backs up. Inside is a man and a woman in their late 50s, and he says in a husky voice, Where are you headed, boy? Nevada City. Any distance helps. We'll get in. We're going to Yuba. They seemed normal enough, even without most of their teeth and hair. So I jumped in. It all happened in rapid succession. I toss my bag in the back and jump in. I shut the door. I notice a pile of guns and bullets on the floor. Before I have time to rethink my decision, we speed off. So as I'm trying to assess whether or not I'm in danger, they start telling me how this guy just got out of jail for aggravated assault. How he beat some guy so bad that he can't even think straight no more and they both started to laugh. She was holding his seatbelt over his chest, and they both smell like crap, and they start asking how much money I have. I think, yep, I'm not safe here. After hitchhiking all this way, I don't look very wealthy. I'm filthy, I need a shower. I look no different than the stereotypical homeless guy. So I try to seem more poor than I am, and more tough than I am too. I'm broke as heck, man. That's why I'm going to the city. I'm hoping to make some cash trimming. The man looks me in the eye. Well, you'll find it alright. You'll find it good. Don't be afraid to do no dirty work. If people try, they'll try to screw you over. So you screw them over first. You get what I'm saying? Put your eyes on the dang road. Jesus Christ. The woman points forward and he swerves back to the right lane. He asked me if I smoke, and knowing that California has legalized weed, I put two and two together, he's offering me a joint. So I say, yeah, I smoke. With a wild look in his eyes, he exclaims, great, and we turn off the highway and start down a dirt road. I'm more than worried and I look behind us. In the back of the truck is my bag, a chainsaw, a pickaxe, and a plastic tarp over something. And it didn't help my anxiety. Finally, we stop out in front of a clearing. The woman takes out not a joint but a meth pipe. And it's the first time that I've seen one, and a lot of things start to make sense. While he lights up and exhales into the car, I've never seen smoke so white. I roll down the windows because I don't want to smoke that crap. The woman takes them as well, and they tell me how they were going to collect money that a woman owes them. That dang girl is going to pay one day or another. She better have the money, or I'm going to grab her and say, Where's my money? Oh, she'll have it all right. She'll have it or else. You say, son, you ever steal something? Because we could make $20,000 today. I don't know exactly how to answer this guy. And he repeats, $20,000 today. Here, smoke some of this. And he hands me the pipe. Nothing like the good stuff, ain't that right? I gently reject it and say that it's not really my thing, which he surprisingly takes well and smokes some more before putting it away and driving off back towards the highway. His driving is terrible, swerving, speeding, hitting brakes abruptly, and starts trying to convince me to steal some marijuana plants. You'll hold my gun and I'll hold the drill, and I'll keep lookout. Yeah, baby girl, you keep lookout now. You gotta be careful if you hear the dogs because they some son of a guns are nasty. Nasty. You see this bite. 
and he reviews what looks like a terrible scar on his arm. I didn't really know how to get out of the situation, so I sounded as confident as possible and said that I was meeting a friend to look for work together, and that they would be expecting me today. We neared the end of Yuba City, where they pull over to the side. Well, it's your funeral. You don't want to eat? Fine by me, but if you ever want that cash, you call me. Then he hands me his number. Heck no, I think. Uh, thanks, I will. Quickly retrieving my bag, smiling nervously. The woman says with a wave, Take care now, God bless. And they speed off. I'm standing on the side of the road thinking, What the heck was that? Just happy to be out of the car. I've had multiple trips. The reason was because it cost too much to always travel from town to city. I was living there for six months and I wanted to see my girlfriend at the time and had to always get hotels over the weekend to stay. So I thought that I would save some money by hitchhiking. I would never ever suggest anyone to hitchhike. One, a very nice couple picked me up and during the drive, we just talked about each other's lives. But what worried me is when the boyfriend asked his girlfriend to pass him a beer while driving. Later on in the night, they were saying that they were meeting their friends for a home dinner party and if I would like to join them. Maybe I was the dinner, I thought. 2. Two guys who just recently got out of prison picked me up. Being a guy with long hair and a ponytail didn't really help the situation either. I had a pocket knife on me but they were nice and I managed to adapt to the conversation since I had known a few rough around the edges sort of people myself. But during one of the conversations, they said, how awesome would it be to drag some chick into the woods and take turns. I also had to go to urinate and when they stopped on the side of the road, I got kind of worried that I was going to get attacked from behind. 3. While walking home one night, it's a long strip of nothing but bushes and I didn't want to pay for a taxi. It's about an hour and a half walk. Someone pulled up beside me with a fast looking car. Nothing fancy really. He rolls down the window and it's a young guy around my age and asked if I wanted to ride. I said sure, why not? Hope you don't mind if I go fast. Oh and also, this isn't my car. I might have borrowed or stole it off my friend. In my brain I'm just thinking, cool 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 in a stolen car zooming down the road why not for a more wholesome story but not much to go on them other than a father who spoke proudly of his sons who was making it into music and another guy who would occasionally move a towel from the window to give his dog some shade and for the last one also a truck driver had picked me up once and i got to see how trucks are and the amount of space that they were behind the front seats Overall, there's some goods and bads when you hitchhike, but still, I wouldn't recommend it. When I was growing up, my sister and I would sometimes hitchhike to get to where we wanted to go, such as the local pool and so on. Of course, this meant that we encountered our fair share of creeps, even at the ages of 12, 13, or 14. The town that we lived in was very wealthy, but we were poor and living in a rented upper floor of a duplex with our mom. I didn't know it until later, but there were a lot of bad people in that town. I know this from a first-hand experience. Since we were poor, we didn't have a car and didn't even have bikes until later. Being in such a wealthy neighborhood, there were no buses, not even school buses. So walking and hitchhiking was how we mainly got around then. There was one time when I was trying to get home that a man picked me up. Bear in mind that this guy was probably one of the local neighborhood dads, or maybe an older brother of someone, though I didn't know him. It was pretty much only families living in that suburban town. Lots of creeps there and that's not even the worst that happened. But then he passed my street and didn't even move to slow down. It appeared that he intended to keep going so I told him that, hey, he had passed my street. He said that that was okay and he tried to grab at me. Well, he did grab me for a second, but I somehow got him to stop the car and got home safely. Of course, I didn't tell anyone since I would have been in trouble anyway for hitchhiking. And these people likely count on this. 
I think I was 12 at the time. I was also followed home when I was 17 and mugged on my very own street. I'm giving this background to explain why I had some degree of self-assurance and well-less stupidity in what happens next. This experience happened before cell phones and GPS. I was 23 at the time. I had just moved to Michigan from several states away to start a new job at a factory. I didn't know anything at all about the state. I arrived late on a Sunday after all the packing to move in the long drive so I just crashed in an exhausted heap in a hotel near the factory. I had to start work immediately the next morning. We had to clock in and out as I recall. Only got a 30 minute lunch and two 15 minute breaks that you also had to clock in and out for. And you got docked if you went over the time. Which was not enough to allow you to leave during the workday. We worked 12 hours a day from 7am to 7pm. And I think 8 to 4 on Sundays. It was winter then so I arrived and left in the dark. That meant I really didn't have much of a chance to explore my new neighborhood. I just went to and from work. I didn't have any friends or relatives in the entire state either, much less where I worked. By the end of my first work week, due to having to pay for lunches and so on, I had exhausted the small amount of cash that I had. I finally got some time off the first Sunday. My car was very nearly out of gas at this point and I had no way to pay for gas without cash. I didn't even have a credit card or a gas credit card or even a local check since I hadn't been able to get to a local bank to open an account yet. I also didn't know where the nearest gas station was, but figured that I would come across one because this factory was very much near a major interstate, though the area around the factory was very rural and sparsely populated. Since all I had was a department store credit card, my plan to get gas was as follows. I found out from people around work that there is a large mall off of an exit on the interstate, and the mall was about a 15 minute drive away. The department store that I had the credit card with was at this mall. I knew from prior experience that I would be able to cash a check there and then use the cash at a gas station. I figured that I had enough gas to make this short trip, so I headed out onto the interstate. The store closed at 5pm that day but I had time to make it. I think the bill pay credit department where I was going to cash the check closed at 4.30 but I'm not sure. I was planning to get there by 5 and was hoping for the best, so time was a bit tight. I had covered a few miles on the interstate when I felt the car slowing and noticed that it would no longer respond to my pressing my foot on, on the gas pedal. Crap, I had run out of gas. I managed to pull under the shoulder before the car died. I didn't have AAA, which could have brought me gas. I have it now, and even if I did, I had no way to call for help. I also didn't even really know where I was other than being on the interstate between work and this mall. Also, the clock was ticking, and every minute that passed was bringing me closer to the store closing time, which was my only hope for cash and ultimately gas, maybe until the following Sunday. Crap. I was thinking about walking but didn't see any gas stations ahead, and hadn't passed any either. A few minutes later, a car pulled up on the shoulder in front of me and asked if I needed help. The driver was a man, appearing to be in his late 30s or early 40s. Nothing about his demeanor raised any alerts at that time, but he was a stranger so I had my guard up. I told him that I ran out of gas and was going to walk to a station, though I had no money. I didn't want him to know that I had no options. He said that there weren't any stations close by and that he would give me a ride. Eh, crap. I really really didn't want to do this but I felt that I had no choice. If it happened today, I would have just asked the person to call road service for me but it wasn't possible. And I had experience growing up taking rides from strangers and nothing really happened. I decided that I had to do it but that I would set up hard against the passenger side door in case he tried to grab me and I would jump out if things got scary. Note that I had never heard of Ted Bundy and how he'd abducted women at the time. He had removed the car door handles on the passenger side so they couldn't escape. I'm kind of glad I didn't know this. My rescuer starts driving and asking me questions as he drove. I didn't want to disclose much information. 
But he finds out that I just moved there and didn't really know anyone. And then he said that, You really shouldn't just get in a car with a stranger. Haven't you heard that there is a killer on the loose, and a few girls about your age have been killed? My blood ran cold, but he smiled and said that I was safe with him. Yeah, right. He exited the interstate and made a few turns. We got to a shell gas station which wasn't visible from the interstate. At this point, I had no idea where I was, how to get back to my car exactly where I was. The gas station also had a working garage that was still open. I told the guy that I would be right back and that he could wait out front, which luckily he did, so I got to go in alone. I told the cashier that I needed gas and that I also needed a gas can. She said that she didn't have any to sell. I told her that actually I didn't have any money, and I was in a pinch and asked if I could borrow one. She said that she couldn't help. I went back out front and told the guy this. He said that it was okay. He lived nearby and had his own gas pump. We could just go to his house. Come on, let's go, and started walking to his car. No way. I turned around and I went into the gas station garage where I immediately noticed a couple of gas cans leaning up against the wall. I grabbed one and I took it to the pump, where I filled it up with a gallon or so of gas. I went back to the cashier and told her that I was taking the gas can and the gas. She said that I couldn't do that, and I said that yes I was going to do this and I was going to leave my driver's license and department store credit card as collateral and that I would be back to pay for the gas and return the can. I also told her that I was in trouble and that I didn't know this guy, that he was talking about serial killers and wanted to take me to his house, and she had to let me take the gas and the can and I wasn't leaving without it. I put my driver's license and credit card down on the counter and assured her that I would be back. And then I had to get back in this guy's car and hope that he would take me back instead of off to some field to take care of me. I know that he also knew that the gas station had my ID, so I assumed that if I didn't return with the can, they might recall that I was there with this guy. I thought that this might provide some measure of protection. Luckily, he did take me back to my car. He then asked me for the car keys. I really didn't want to give them to him. There was no reason for him to at all for them, and he also took the gas can from me and poured the gas into the tank. I didn't want him to take the can from me either, but was still hoping that maybe things would turn out okay if I just kept acting like all of this was normal. He then told me to pop the hood and that he would check the engine. I held my hand out for the keys and luckily he gave them back. I didn't know what he was going to do once he had access to the engine. Remove the distributor cap. Remove the spark plugs wires. Unhook the battery. It didn't make sense to me that he needed to look under the hood when I knew I was just out of gas. He told me to try to start the car and I did. And then when he told me to pop the hood, it only opened a bit until the latch caught it, since you still had to use the manual release from the front of the car to get the hood fully open. And as he was walking along the side of the car towards the front to finish opening the hood, my accelerated off of the hood still partially open. I heard him yell and assume that he went back to his car but didn't see him again. I found my way back to the gas station and returned the empty gas can. I picked up my license and credit card and got the department store in time where I cashed the largest check they allowed. I tried to never run out of gas again and now study maps before I venture out somewhere new even though I now have GPS. Maybe this guy was just trying to help. Maybe he was a concerned dad who saw a girl in trouble and there was nothing more to it. There's a high probability of this. Most people in Michigan are really nice and helpful, but they have had their fair share of killers too. But what if he was just trying to help, and then why tell me about serial killers and try to get me to go to his house? I don't know, but I'm glad I never found out. <laughs>